and welcome everybody to another episode of the Shabbat Show. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be back with you again another Friday. It's amazing how the weeks are flying by. We're almost at spring. In fact, this week we celebrate the beginning of the month of Adar, which is the month that has within it one of the best Jewish holidays, Purim. And this is like, this is the beginning. We're in spring now and you can almost feel it. And if you're in the Northeast, God reminds us that winter is not over yet, as we, at least in the in our area, have had our third or fourth little uh, snow uh, so storm over here. But it's we're almost there, so it's great to be with you. And wherever you're joining us from from around the world, we thank you for being part of the Shabbat show, and thank you for joining us as we bring in Shabbat together and try to really push ourselves each and every week um, as the week comes to an end. Of course, the show is sponsored as a program of the Carl Enoch Goldman Center of Jewish Values. We thank Jay Goldman for his sponsorship and his friendship, and, uh, and we really uh, appreciate the partnership. You know, I remember reading a moment in modern Jewish history where Golda Meir, the former prime minister of the state of Israel, went around the world in search of help in the 1970s after Israel was in the middle of one of its worst wars, the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And she was faced with very little assistance. And it was on the plane home that she came to the realization that we have no choice but to help ourselves. In some ways, that's been the history of our people. God puts us in this world and says, I know you want the world to help. And there are people along the way that help us. But you have to understand that every single one of you is capable of helping your nation. Each and every one, every one of us has given a role. Every one of us could be an ambassador for each other, to stand for something, to stand up for something. None of us in any which way are irrelevant to the future of our nation. The topic of this show is ambassadors. Ambassadors are regular people. Some of them have rose to positions of prominence, maybe in business, maybe in politics. Some of them are just doing their jobs and they wouldn't otherwise be ambassadors, but for the fact that they feel like they are Jewish, they're proud and they're willing to take a stand in whatever which way that is, whether it's just in how they act or in what they say. Me and you are ambassadors. All of us have a role to play in our nation. There's no one that's extra. And no one could look around and go, someone else is doing. That's not how God set us up. And that's what the show is all about. It's about meeting people. We're gonna meet a whole group of amazing people from different parts of, of, of society, different parts of the world. But they all have one thing in common that along the way they realized that they are ambassadors for the Jewish people. And in any which way they do it, it's part of their lives. And you'll see, as we go through these interviews today, you'll see that this feeling of being an ambassador doesn't burden them, it emboldens them. So it's a privilege that makes them the greatest version of themselves. Because that's our job. That's my job and that's your job no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, is to see yourself as an ambassador to our people. We got a great show. We got a lot of great guests this show. We got jo Josh Brody, who's on. He's a lawyer and partner at a major New York City law firm. We got Ralph Hertzka on, a CEO of Meridian Capital. He is an incredible benefactor, philanthropist, businessman in the Jewish community. We got Mrs. Esti Stoller on, who is the center of activity, action, and excitement for so many things in the Jewish community. We've got Arya Lightstone on, person who has, who is the deputy, the ambassador, David Freeman. He was uh, one of the key figures in the Abraham Accords. And we've got, of course, Mr. Malcolm Holine on, who is one of the Jewish community's great legends, who has been working tirelessly on our behalf for for decades. We've got a great show of incredible people. We're going to hear their stories. We're going to hear about their perspectives. You don't want to miss it. Stick with us to all the way to the end. Of course, we'd love to hear from you. Please feel free. Drop us a Shabbat Shalom. 
on Zoom, or you can go to my Facebook page. We'd love to hear from you, and it allows everyone to, to feel connected to each other. And of course, Kahoot's going to come up in about a half an hour with God's help. So just start now. Like, you know, just as you're listening, like just get either your phone app on or get, you know, your Zoom ready. Just get ready to, to compete and, uh, and get ready to play. It's going to be right around 8.30. Next week's a big week. Next week is the Project Inspire uh, uh, virtual convention. For those of you who have never been to a Project Inspire convention, you are missing out. It was the thing um, back when we had conventions. Um, this year, we're going to be, they're going to be doing it uh, virtual. And so you have three days of an incredible program that's going to be taking place online. You do not want to miss it. It's unbelievable. We're going to have a special Shabbat show next week. We got Nissan Black. We've got Alex Clare. There's a ton of sessions and keynotes. There's a concert from New York artists. We've got an incredible, incredible lineup. You do not want to miss this next weekend, Thursday, Friday, um, Shabbos, Sunday, there's going to be so much going on. Um, and well, Shabbos won't be going on, but everything around that. Don't want to miss it. Just mark your calendars. You'll be seeing more from us. And what we could be doing, and we'd love for you to join us in this, in this project, really, is to be ambassadors for Project Inspire. Project Inspire is spending its every waking moment trying to figure out more and more ways to bring programming to the world. And now we have the opportunity to say thank you. So please check out projectinspire.com and become ambassadors for Project Inspire to help them raise the resources that they need to, to really do the work that they're doing. So starting Wednesday throughout the entire convention, they're having a fundraising campaign. They're trying to raise about a half a million dollars. This is going to support all the work they're doing, including the show. And so we need you, we need you to be part of it. We need you to go on and be ambassadors for Project Inspire. And it's something that you can give back to Project Inspire. I know that it's, it's something that we'll keep on giving because when you give to Inspire, they give to so many others. So it's an incredible return on your time and your investment. Check out projectinspire.com backslash convention. And uh, I am sure, I am sure that it will be uh, really, really something that you'll be very proud of afterwards. Join us in the convention, please. And, and join us in the process of helping raise money so that Inspire can continue doing its wonderful work. Okay, our first guest is Mr. Ralph Hertzka. He's the chairman and CEO of Meridian Capital Group since co-founding the commercial real estate advisory firm in 1991. He remained the guiding force behind the company, company's evolution from a small Brooklyn-based commercial mortgage brokerage to a national leader in real estate markets, having personally arranged over $100 billion in financing. In addition to his professional leadership, Mr. Hertzka is dedicated philanthropist, raising millions of dollars for various organizations over his career. He lives in Brooklyn with his wife and his family. Ralph, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. It is great to have you on. The show is about being an ambassador and how every single Jew has that in them. You know, you started your career as a businessman. And as your career developed, you got more and more opportunity to really represent the Jewish people. Share with us a little bit through your career, how you realized just how important it was, not only what you do for a living, but what you stand for as a Jew. Well, I think very early on, um, going into the mortgage business and the real estate business in New York City, and just coming across so many people from so many different walks of life, and having the opportunity to really stand out and show that you can act in a certain way and really just enhance the relationship in so many different ways. So I was really young when I started out in real estate, 19, 20 years old, just partially in yeshiva. And I realized how people sometimes, you know, could have a wrong impression and you can really change that just by being nice, being polite, and just embracing so many different aspects of, of people's life and some of their issues. And I think that's one of the things that I, I continue to do and, and, and talk to all my people at Meridian on a daily basis about doing. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's nice that you said that. I think people need to appreciate, you know, Jews are stereotyped, whether we like it or not, whether we admit it or not, we are. You've experienced it. I've experienced it. Somebody thinks they know Jews because of an experience they had with a particular Jew. Do you feel, and, and especially to what you said, how the way you act really is sending a message much bigger than anybody thinks. 
at what point did you start to realize that your actions are being watched and really being connected to the larger Jewish people? So very early on in my career, you know, growing up in Brooklyn and working in New York City, we're a little bit, you know, insulated from the real world. Um, but the minute I started traveling and going to conferences and, and meeting people, it was just, it was very obvious that, you know, I was on high alert, you know, just the elevator doors opened and they expected me to just run in or run out. And being polite and letting someone else out first was, oh, thank you. And then just starting a nice dialogue. So I remember going to a conference in San Diego and going up, you know, standing at the bottom of the escalator and standing there, a religious kid with a yarmulke and, you know, letting two people go ahead of me. Well, that was so thoughtful. That's so nice. Um, and it triggered a conversation of a story that they had in an airport where they had a different experience. And I think as, as you go through life and you meet people and you have these experiences, they really do start defining to you how we have the ability. And as recent as just a couple of weeks ago, we got together as a small group and in a hotel and very sensitive to COVID. And I made sure just to remind all the people that were together how important the masks are, how important social distancing. And when the elevator opens up and there's three people on it, just remember that we're limited to four people and just stand back. So I think it's something that we're constantly working on and it's, it's made a big difference. Do you find um, that you were ever in a situation where you had to stand up for something, where you could have bowed out, you could have um, just ignored or moved away, but you felt the responsibility to, to say something or do something on behalf of our people? I've had a lot of situations, but I don't like to, you know, just to say to stand up because I think that when you go through life, you know, and, and you meet so many people and people inherently are good and they're looking for the good in people. That's the way I've always approached it. So if you see, you know, I've had situations where you see people are a little bit surprised and you can just have, a, have an open dialogue, have a conversation and it will trigger a discussion. But I can't really say that I've had some unique situation where I have to stand up for the for the Jewish rights. I mean, I think we're we're always on guard, and I think it's the right thing to do. And um, you know, especially as you travel the world. I mean, now we're all not traveling, but you know, you know, we were in Spain together, Charlie. Right? Remember yeah. that? Yeah. And what what an amazing the, the staff in that hotel came over with us and said they've never been. You remember how excited they were seeing yeah. all the all the all the singing and all the way people were treating them. So I think, I think it's, it's, it, if, you, if you work in it, it becomes a second nature. I think um, it becomes really part of you. Yeah, and I mean, last question, I mean, there's so many questions that I have for you, but I just sort of, I, I know your time is, is, is limited and valuable. How important is it for you to be who you are? You know, sometimes in life, when you go out into the world, we have this feeling that in order to be accepted, I have to be like everybody else. How important was it for you in your career to, to, of course, you treat people with respect, but to always be proud of who you are? So I think it's like anything else. Um, thank God I've been successful. And I'll never forget, you know, talking to a bank once and the banker saying to me, Ralph, it's 3.30 and candlelighting is at 4.15. Why are you in the office. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, really, how do you know that? And he said, it's on the cover of the New York Times. I see it every single day, every single Friday. And I always admire it. So I think that, you know, once people know who you are and they respect you for where you are in every single aspect, it's in, in, in integrity in, in, in the way you approach them. And, and I think now through the, the last few months, just starting a conversation with someone and just saying is, how's your family? How are you, how are you doing in this thing? Just makes the whole conversation a different conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's just the human element of it. Um, you know, I don't know if that really answers the question yeah. that you, you in particular, but I, listen, I am extremely sensitive. I, I'm in the finance world. I meet people from all different walks of life. I've traveled the world and traveled the country and I have a company with several hundred people and I, I make it a real point to just always try to say to myself, if I was 
someone outside looking in, how would I want to be perceived? And I think if there's one message that I can tell everyone that's listening to this, always look at yourself and say, how do I want to be perceived? Whether it's in business, whether it's in a personal life or whatever it is. And I think at the end of the day, if you do that, you will just always come out feeling good about yourself. Amazing. Well, Ralph, thank you so much for the time you spent with us. Today. You know, just, you know, it's interesting just now, even when you walk into buildings and there's the extra security people, and they, they have to take your temperature, they fill out the forms, and you just thank them extra. They feel good about themselves. So yeah. I think it's just always being conscious. For sure. It's great. It's great to see you. I can't wait to see you live soon. <laughs> and keep on doing uh, amazing work on behalf of the Jewish people. Thank you. And you as well. And keep on shining your light in this world. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. And that was Ralph Hertzka. And, and really, con he continues to, to lead the way in terms of being a, um, a model for so many others. Check out this poetry slam video in the Bronx. Listen to this teenager. Look at this video that we found. Give it up for Ethan Metzger. Yeah. There's someone I know who is slow to commend but quick to condescend, who's reluctant to lend a hand but ready to point and laugh at those who need one. One day I was in school, in class, explaining my Judaism when this person has the audacity to exclaim, you know, you're only Jewish because your parents forced you to be. I mean, it's all fake. You don't pray to God because you want to. You only pray to God because your parents made you think you have to. You don't keep any of the laws of your own free will. Your parents just made you feel guilty like you didn't keep them. My classmates smirked. Your parents brainwashed you your whole life, made you think you were doing God's work, but they were just imposing restriction upon restriction. You don't have any real conviction of your own. You don't really know anything about anything. A silence swept over the classroom. I could sense all my friends look at me as to how I would react. I felt like this tear went after me, and more importantly, my parents. Excuse me, I thought. My parents brainwashed me. I had to think of a response, but the more I thought, the more I realized that the student actually had a very valid argument. I thought to myself, you're absolutely right. My parents did brainwash me. From the time I entered this world, my parents brainwashed me. As early as I can remember, my parents were brainwashing me to have respect for other people, for their belongings, and for myself. Nice. Since I was little, they corrupted me into thinking that I need to treat everyone else the way I would want to be treated, no matter what. My parents programmed me into believing that I should stand up for someone if that person were, be were being picked on, that I shouldn't be a bystander if I could stop evil from taking place. My parents brainwashed me? Yeah. My father twisted my infant brain in such a horrific way that he made me value my integrity. And to make matters even worse, he led by example. And my mom, she incessantly told me as a child again and again and again to just do the best you can. And that idea has now become so ingrained in my mind that I don't define success as whether I get an A or win the game, but as to give it my all. My parents perverted my way of thinking causing me to believe that I need to be accepting of other people and their beliefs. They contaminated my childhood with mottos and maxims and lessons about love and faith and character. And yes, religion too. And I'm sorry for you that your parents clearly didn't infect your DNA with any of these ideals. But I didn't say any of that. Because my parents also polluted my conscience to believing that I shouldn't judge someone until I walk a mile in their shoes, which it makes me think that God must throw millions of marathons each day. And quite frankly, I don't have the stamina for that. But here's what I did say. You can call it brainwashing if you want. That's fine. I call it teaching. Thank you. video you know as as he's speaking it dawns on me just how just what ralph said a minute ago it dawns on me just how much people are good when somebody challenges someone's faith and you come back and you express who you are with a little bit of confidence just how quickly everybody comes around you incredible incredible courage of that young man um, and it, it really is very, very much the story of our people standing up for what we believe in and having people around us 
the good people around us realizing just how important that is. Our next guest is Mrs. Esty Stoller. She's an attorney and a mother of eight, founder and CEO of J Inspire Long Island, a popular project inspire leader, momentum community leader and bus leader since 2011. I should tell you that she's not just a bus leader, she's a legend in bus leading. And she delivers one of the most exciting posts on Instagram every week, a, an individual like no other. Esty, welcome to the show. Hello there. Oh my gosh, it's Charlie. <laughs> it's so great to have you on. It's so I live in your neighborhood <laughs> and I also have an autographed copy of your book. Actually, I have a complete set of them. I just kept getting the autographs. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Esty. It's so great to have you on. And I know that you are so involved in Project Inspire. What? Let's talk a little bit about your involvement with Inspire. I hear that it's been almost a decade since you got involved. Yes, well, I'm 20 years old now, so that means I started at around 10. Actually, I just want to say how blessed I feel that I'm on tonight because this is the creme de la creme, the cream of the cream, because C is for Charlie, a -R, R is for Ralph, E is for Esty, A is for Arye, M is for Malcolm, and of course that spells cream, the cream de la creme, the best of the best tonight, and of course since it's Project Inspire, they always put a J in, so either J or Josh. Right, right, so right. It's always right. You got to put a J somewhere in everything. J cream. I'm happy to be on tonight and tell you why I got involved. Yes. Well, I was this simple, sweet little girl, very understated and quiet. And then Project Inspire came into my life. When you love something, when you feel strongly about something, when you feel you have a treasure, which is our Judaism, I wanted other people to know about it. I grew up in a loving home and a family that said Judaism was the best thing. Torah is a connection, a relationship. I'm into that. I want to have this relationship and this connection. So. I got involved in Project Inspire. Of course, I didn't know what to do. I'm living in this community here and I needed people to come on a trip. So actually, since I have eight kids, I write my name in all my things. I wrote in shoes, even in shoes. And someone found my shoe on the beach in Florida and they saw the phone number and they said they want to return the shoe. And I said, I want to return you to Judaism. So come on my trip. And I'm very committed because right now, we all know it's the holiday of Purim, speaking of which, here we are, Queen Esther, and it's about happiness. Judaism brings happiness. Judaism is full of miracles. I'm so committed that, well, you know, this is when we have Shalach Manis. You know, we send them out. And I was in Washington. My parents were being honored. And I wanted to give out, just like Project Inspire now, we're giving out Shalach Manis, the gift baskets to other Jews. And I brought them along. And I said, I'm going to bring it into the center to give it out. Let them know what Judaism is. How generous we are, how we love people, how we care about everyone. So what did I do? I said, I'm bringing it in. They say, no food. I said, but this is holy food. They said, no food. <laughs> so I went outside and this was after 9-11 and I decided to hide it. You know, there are beautiful trees around there. I decided to hide it under a tree, these baskets. And I put it under a tree. All of a sudden, FBI is all around me. You know, they're very suspicious. Could you imagine that? I the can't imagine. The next thing I said, I'm going to give it to some lady. And she was going towards her office. I said, here, can you take this package? It's very important. Take it up to your office, but don't tell anyone around it. The next thing, I'm surrounded by security guards and the FBI. And I said, they said, why? What are you doing? I said, this is holy food that I'm giving out. They said, where's your ID? I said, I don't carry ID. I don't want anyone to know how old I am. But that's my husband. But of course, he was running in the other direction. Anyway, when you feel commitment, when you feel strong, I wasn't arrested. Whatever. When you feel something strong, when you want to say, you know what I discovered and the people on the trips discovered that whether you're secular, affiliated or non-affiliated, we're all alike. I don't know how many people are exactly like me, but we all have the Jewish spark within us. And it just takes someone to like that spark. Amazing. Have, and, you know, have an and open you, And you got so much to share and so much to give. And I've had the honor uh, of, of being able to speak after you, which is a very hard thing to do because <laughs> nobody can follow you properly. You know, we, we're speaking tonight about being an ambassador. And what that means is recognizing each and every one of us really represents each other. 
Do you feel that way when you go around and you're able to speak in places and inspire people and, and like you said, make people happy? Do you feel that, you know, you're not just representing yourself, but you're representing the, 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 the Jewish people? Not only do I feel like I'm representing the Jewish people, but I love the Jewish people and I love each person. I think everyone has a unique power in them that they should use. I said, oh, it's a little like, let's say a puzzle piece. I love these little things. We all have to fit together, but yet we're all unique. Missing pieces doesn't work. So as long as you're Jewish, I say, anyone, chicken soup, the way everyone's hot. And Charlie, do you remember that we started in our house that you met Lori Palatnik? Right. And you decided it's not just the women, it's the men. Because yep. Judaism is a family event. We've had people come to our house and I, I've seen them. One time this kid comes over to the mother, says, Ma, never mind, never mind. I said, what's that all about? And he said, um, well, my mother promised me a prize if I come on Friday night to the Shabbos meal. But you know what? I had such a good time here that she doesn't have to give me anything. Showing no. what Judaism is, showing them what they're entitled to, what Shabbos is, the togetherness, the family. I remember somebody even said, I don't believe that I've seen my parents off their phone for three hours since I'm born. And when we spread love, when we give it, that's the way we do it. And of course, challah always helps. We bake mm -hmm. the challah, we have the, a whole week I have just my windows open and the smell of challah and people yeah, just- Challah does everything. Right. Esther, thank, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's an honor to have you on and Project Inspire is so appreciative of the relationship. Like I said, the momentum lead, trips that you lead are legendary and the J Inspire, uh, groups that you are responsible for and you lead really are incredible. And we thank you for your for your ambassadorship and we thank you for shining your light in this world. But I want everyone else to be ambassador. They don't have to be me. Everyone could be an ambassador. And if they come next week on the convention and they help support, then they're an ambassador. And this week's sure. Parsha, as you know, in the Pusik 24 seven, the Jewish people say, we will accept and we will listen 24 mm seven. -hmm. We are Jewish. We're all in this together. I'm waiting for the next book. Anyway, my book seven twenty four seven 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 seven. It must mean something. Charlie, <laughs> it's always great to be with oh, you. Oh, it's an honor. Thank you so much. Thank Everyone you, out there, you're special. You're unique. Become an ambassador. Become <laughs> me. I have extra clothes, <laughs> and I have a lot of love to give. Seven twenty four seven 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 seven. You're Jewish. Enjoy. It. Be proud. Man, thank you, Esty. We appreciate you being on. We appreciate all that you do. And thank you so much for your partnership with the Project Inspire. Check out this video that we found. What an incredible video uh, about standing up for others, featuring a thousand and one voices from yeshivas across the United States. Check this out. Why do we push to be a part? Why don't we be a part of something? Something that is so much stronger. Why are we silent in our pain? Why don't we join to see a change? Something that will bring us closer. Life's better when you're with your brother. Let us all stay. Troubles all my own Picking up those broken pieces Building you up to find your strength You can be confident again See all of the good I'm seeing Life's better when you're with your brother Let us all stand up for each other Watch our struggle fade away Let's create
powerful video. And it's really true. You stand up for each other, you stand up for the things around you. One of the great mistakes that I think we make is to think that we think that being an ambassador for the Jewish people requires uh, an appointment, requires some big, huge issue. It doesn't. It's the small things in life. That's what it means to be a Jew. It means to be a human being. God puts us in this world and says, look, just look outside your lenses. Just look outside. Family, people around you, your employees, stand up for each other. Smile, be there for each other. Give somebody, give someone a little bit of inspiration and encouragement. That's how we do it. And so it's an honor to be able to, to be part of this. And yes, we stand up for each other. It's now 8.32. That means it's time for Kahoot. If you're, this is your first time being on the show. This is the time to compete. Go to Kahoot.it or go to Kahoot on your app, 422-6644. Type in 422 66 Four four, we got a high Charlie player here. We appreciate that. Some of the old ones are coming back here. And if you haven't yet, please let us know. Uh, we'd love to wish you a Shabbat Shalom. Let's begin with the Lulas as people start joining in to the Begun and Bolton family. Shabbat Shalom to Hirsch in Chicago. Shabbat Shalom to Fran Hirsch in Chicago. Shabbat Shalom to the Novak family in Toronto. The Silvers in Highland Park. Shabbat Shalom. The Shabbat Shalom to Linda in Boston. From John to John in Oxfordshire, England. John, we love you. The fact that you're on now, it's the middle of the night. We appreciate that. To, to Maura Bela in, in Maynard, Massachusetts, to the Diamonds in Lakewood, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom to everyone that's, that's jumping in right now. To David in Rockville, we thank you for your kind word. To Leah Peril in New York City, thank you. The Levin family in Southfield, Michigan. One more minute, last minute to jump on to our Kahoot for this week. We appreciate everyone being here. Let's give it one more minute as people are jumping on right now. We still have a couple of seconds. No, I see Robert Shepwitz is on now. Now we're ready to roll. Giants rock, Patriots rock. I think the Harari is on. So I think we've got a lot of people who just give it 10 more seconds. And for those that are want to jump onto this thing, please feel free to do that. Okay, let's get rolling. Kahoot time. Here goes, Kahoot at work. First question. The White House Abraham Accord signing ceremony took place on September 17th, 1978, September 15th, 2020, January 20th, 2021, or August 2nd, 1990. When were the Abraham Accord signings? This is a good question for us because our next guest was very involved in the building of the Abraham Accords. Shabbat Shalom to the Levin family in Southfield, Michigan. When were the Abraham Accords signed to Carol Drucker in New York City, Shabbat Shalom, the Mervis family in Silver Spring? And the answer is September 15, 2020, earlier this year, the Abraham Accords were signed. Let's see how we do. RM. Ricky Fox, Novak and from Toronto, Winnin Omada. Winnin Omada has been around a lot. I would like to ask Winnin Omada to identify him or herself. And now we got this new Cows Moo player who I think is brand new to this team over here. So congratulations for making the leaderboard. Let's go to the next question. The Jewish woman serving in the Bahraini ambassador of the United States from 20, this Jewish woman from the Bahraini ambassador from 2008-2013. Huda Ezra Ibrahim Nunu, Elena Teplitz, Ayelet Shaked, and Ada Tuma. Who is a Jewish woman who is serving as the Bahraini ambassador? Do you see the extent of the knowledge that we are expecting of you in the Kahoot games? Unbelievable. This is great stuff over here. And people are answering the questions, which is great. To Tanya in Austin from Toronto, Shabbat Shalom. To Jen from Georgia, Shabbat Shalom. And the answer is Huda Ezra Ibrahim Nunu. Only six people got that right. That's going to mess up our leaderboard here. RM stays on top. Go RM for getting that one right. Eileen, Ricky Fox, the Novak is still on. And Shopsies is coming up pike over here. Congratulations for the second question. Let's go to number three. This former NFL Super Bowl champion now works for APAC Lobbying Group that advocates pro-Israel policies. Mitch Schwartz, Jeff Schwartz, Taylor Mays, or Alan Weingred. 
which one of these former NBA Super Bowl champions and now work for APAC. Shabbat Shalom to Jen in New York. On my list, on my Facebook, Shabbat Shalom to Linda from Boston. Shabbat Shalom to Vered Golan and happy birthday. Vered turned 60 tonight. Congratulations. The answer is Alan Vinegrad. Alan Vinegrad is our answer. It's a great guy, Alan Vinegrad. I had a chance to spend the Shabbat with him a while ago. Ricky, F- Ricky Rocks, RM Stallon, winning all matters back. Browns rock and winner. Okay, here it goes. Last question. This week's Torah portion says you shall not oppress a stranger for who you know the feelings for you know the feelings of a stranger. This week's Torah portion says you will you shall not oppress a stranger for you know the feelings of the stranger because you will be strangers one day because you were strangers in the land of Egypt because it's not nice or because it's racist. Why does God want us to not oppress a stranger? Shabbat shalom to Michael Weingart, my good friend from Germany. Thank you for being on middle of the night over there. Shabbat Shalom to Bet from Smithtown. Thank you for being on as well. For everyone else that's on, the answer is because you were strangers in this land of Egypt. This is a great concept called empathy that God introduces. A lot of people got this one. Let's see how this all shakes out for the for this week's Kahoot winners. Ricky Rocks. I think that's the first one for Ricky Rocks. RM, a usual for us at the leaderboard. And the winner of this week's Kahoot is Win and No Matter. Win and No Matter, identify yourself. Too many weeks at your place in high. We got to know who you are. So congratulations for everybody today on Kahoot. Thanks so much for playing with us. So next guest is an incredible individual. He's a special envoy for the economic normalization for the Abraham Accords. He played a critical role in the actualization of the Abraham Accords, the beginning of the peace in the Middle East from 2017 until January 2021. Aryeh Lightstone served as the senior advisor to David Friedman, the U.S. ambassador to Israel. Prior to joining the State Department, Arya worked as an educator, a management professional, an entrepreneur, and an, and an issue advocate. Arya was actually super involved, intimately involved in the Abraham Accords and a lot of some of the great things have been going on in Israel. Check out my interview earlier this week with Arya Leiston. So Arya, I know that you've spent the past four years running around really changing the state of Israel, changing the uh, relationship between Israel and the rest of the world. If you could just share with us just a few highlights of, of your work over the past four years. So thanks for the question. Uh, it is impossible to decide what the few highlights are, but I'll, I'll share something that I think is relevant in the news uh, today. I remember when Ambassador Friedman first offered me the job uh, I turned at him and I said, look, I appreciate it. I think there are people more qualified than I am. There are certainly people who are smarter than I am, uh, but I'm also a liability for you. I walk around with a keeper on my head. And, uh, you know, when you represent the United States of America, uh, people should know that you're making the decisions in the best interest of the United States of America and not somebody who thinks for some reason that you have an issue with uh, dual loyalty or, or you're confused in terms of who you represent and why you're there. And he paused for a moment, and I remember this conversation extremely clearly. And he said, you know, Ari, if you ask me that question again, you're probably not qualified for the job. Uh, but don't for a half a second think that a keeper holds you back in representing the United States of America. That in any other mission that we would put an ambassador anywhere else in the world, uh, your knowledge of the language, of the people, of the politics, of the spirit, would make you the number one choice to be representing the United States of America there. Uh, Don't you dare for a second think that that holds you back. Uh, And if it does, you're not the right guy for the job. But if you think that your yarmulke propels you forward, uh, then you absolutely are the right guy for the job. And uh, and I realized at that moment uh, that I had to shift my thinking. And it was uh, maybe his second speech that he had given ever as the ambassador. Uh, He said something that still makes my my soul uh, elevate. And, uh, and he was just extremely clear that it's a quintessential American value to be pro-Israel. And that doesn't mean you need to agree with everything Israel does. It's a quintessential R.E. Lightstone value to value my wife, Esty Lightstone. We don't agree on everything, right? But that doesn't mean that I value her, or treasure her, or, or appreciate her any less, even when we have disagreements. 
right? There, there's the ability on behalf of the United States of America to recognize the pure miracle that the state of Israel is. And I would just recommend for people who get confused about that vis-a-vis -vis politics, go back and read Michael Oren's book. Uh, about the founding of the Middle East and the United States' relationship with it, going back to the founding of the United States and our original relationship with uh, with the Middle East, going back to the 1700s. It is, it is, this is not a new relationship. Uh, it's a deep relationship and it's a meaningful relationship. And frankly, it's based as much on the soul as it is on the mind. Uh, today, in the last 25 years, it's a no-brainer that Israel gives pound for pound to the United States greater than any of our other allies. It's not such a big country, right. but on a pound for pound basis, Israel is a reciprocal alliance with the United States of America, and it's in our 100% interest to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. What's it like as somebody who walks around as an ambassador to the Jewish people in the various roles that you have? What, what has that done for you, and has, how has that made you who you are? Uh, you, you have a tremendous responsibility, and uh, what that means is uh, if you take the day off, and, and for four years, I, I, I took very few of them off, uh, because I think you taught me this a long time ago. If you love what you do, uh, it's not called work. And uh, and every time I put on my embassy pin, my U.S. flag, my U.S. Israel flag, whatever is on my jacket that day, uh, what greater pride and privilege am I ever going to have than representing the greatest country in the yeah. history of the world to a country that I adore, adore and, 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 and love? So, But you have tremendous responsibility. When I make a statement, I'm not speaking on behalf of Ari Lightstone or on behalf of even the Jewish people. I'm speaking on behalf of the United States of America, but it carries additional responsibility because uh, Haaretz introduced me uh, uh, divisively when I was first appointed uh, as Orthodox rabbi from Long Island, which is almost as flattering as when they call David Friedman the Orthodox bankruptcy attorney from Long Island, as though either of those are things that define us. Uh, they don't. They're part of who we are. Uh, hopefully one day it'll be Nobel nominated. Uh, it won't be awarded because these are political now, but but having been involved with four and with Kosovo, five peace treaties in six months, something that no administration ever has accomplished a half of that in four years. Uh, I have tremendous pride in what we accomplished. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, but enormous humility. The media has been very good at keeping us humble. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make one comment, Charlie, to your crowd? Okay. Yeah, please. Um, number one is, I guess I said one comment. I'm going to make two comments. Uh, number one is, is that we absolutely need more inspiration in this world. It is, it is, it, COVID brings out in some of us the best of us, like the Abraham Accords, and some of us the worst of us, uh, the rioting and violence that you saw in many different places over the course of the summer and as recently as January 6th. Uh, it's up to us to elevate the conversation, not denigrate the conversation. The next time you want to talk about somebody, decide whether you actually need to talk about that somebody or you can talk about something, you can talk about an idea. And that's what being inspired is all about, getting to talk about ideas is what Shabbat is about. That's what being able to do that. I, I, if it doesn't start at home, it's not going to start anywhere. It's not starting from any of our leaders. It's, we, we need to take this upon all of ourselves to be able to do that. But the second thing is, look, COVID is going to be behind us at some point in time. When you travel, I would just encourage you to do the following thing. Add on to your trip to Israel, which all of your listeners should have on your absolute must visit. Add on an Abraham Accord country. And when you stay in that hotel, when you get in that taxi cab, when you, when you uh, speak to your travel agent, tell them because they made peace with Israel, I'm going to go spend some of my tourism dollars there. Wow. And you tell everybody that. And, and in that way, you become an ambassador. I like, I hope that uh, that uh, when you leave the, the whatever hotel, the Motel 8 or the Ritz-Carlton in Abu Dhabi, it doesn't make a difference to me. When you leave there, they come out and they say, the people who stayed here, they represent the best of the Jewish people. Because we all have to be ambassadors to that. So I, I hope you guys will join me uh, in that mission because it's a really holy and, and special endeavor. It's amazing. Ari, Ari, thank you so much for what you do for us and continued success in all of your endeavors. Thank you, Charlie, for inspiring all of us. I was Ari Lightstone. Uh, you can check out ShabbatShow.com starting early next week, and you can see the full interview there. Uh, we spoke about some other things there, as in, including some of the inside scoop on uh, the Abraham Accords and the moment where they realized it was going to happen. There's some interesting, uh, he gave us some interesting insights to the inside of the process. Um, very fascinating interview, and including one of the most um, 
one of the most important moments that took place earlier on in Trump's presidency, where he did something that seemed to be very technical, but it sent a really big message to the Middle East. So you can check out that interview, the full interview that, that's on the Shabbatshow.com. Don't forget the Project Inspire convention is going to be coming up next week. You can check out the entire convention here um, over the weekend. It's going to be an amazing, amazing program. So please mark your calendars for next week for the Project Inspire virtual convention taking place right here. Our next guest is Mr. Malcolm Holmline. He's currently the vice chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations. In June 1986, he was elected the CEO and executive vice chairman of the Conference of Presidents, the central coordinating body of, of uh, international and national concerns for 15 national Jewish organizations. He was the founding executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater New York. And earlier, he was the founding executive director of the Greater New York Conference of Sober Jewry. Mr. Holan has traveled across the globe, meeting with top world leaders, heads of Jewish communities, business leaders, and opinion matters. That's really just the tip of the iceberg. Mr. Holan has spent his entire life, entire adult life, fighting, defending, representing, and worrying about the Jewish community. And it's an honor to have him on the show. Uh, Mr. Holman, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be with you, Charlie. It's, it's, we're talking about being an ambassador, and there are a few people that I know in my life who represent that more than you. Uh, you've spent your whole life, I guess, feeling the burden, the privilege, and the responsibility of representing our people. Share with us a little bit, if you can, um, what that's like, what that's like, um, always thinking about the Jewish people and some of the things that you've encountered as the power of each person along the way? Well, first of all, uh, I'm glad that you're addressing this topic because it's a time when we need to enlist new people, new leadership, young people to get involved, to be inspired. And that's a full-time project for all of us to get, um, to get the next generation to understand their sense of achrayus, of what's at stake. You know, we learned too often in our past from the failure of people to rise to the occasion to understand the opportunities that they have. And each person, and I've seen it repeatedly over the last 50 years that I've run Jewish organizations way beyond the, my professional life, starting in my early teens uh, with Soviet Jewry and with many other causes and starting witches in North America and, and student activities, that it is calling. It's not, it's not a, a burden, but it is a responsibility. But above all, it's a privilege. Because when you look back in your life and you can say, I did something to save Soviet Jews, Iranian Jews, Ethiopian Jews, Syrian Jews, Iraqi Jews, Iranian Jews, what, what is of greater value that you made a difference in people's lives, whether it's an individual or a community or a country, when you can look back and say, I left some, a world a better place for my children, my grandchildren and their grandchildren. You know, you, the wealth you can't take with you. You can have great accomplishments in business and finance and other things, and it's wonderful and it's important. So you can give tzedakah and you can uh, improve the world. But more than that, it's how we affect people's lives and how we engage in improving the world and making it a better place for everyone. And so I have to admit, honestly, I never looked for a job in my life. Every job happened to me. And I believe that I have a contract with God, which is why I still work 18 hour days on the Jewish people. Because I believe as long as I live up to my end, he'll live up to his end. Mm -hmm. But if I fail, he fails me. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, is, um, it is a sense of mission that is so fulfilling and so important. You sacrifice a lot. I, you know, I, I ran umbrella organizations my whole life. And people always ask me, how do I keep 50 Jewish organizations together? I tell them, I give them a common enemy, me. <laughs> they can all focus on that. But I think that, that honestly, you know, the, at this time, when we have such serious challenges and people know both internally and externally in Israel and here in the United States, the COVID, so many other layers of, of dangers, the rise of anti-Semitism, yet there are immense opportunities and great things. Nobody would have predicted the Abraham Accords and you just had uh, Ari discussing that, many other things. So we have, uh, I think, a unique opportunity to to really improve the world for future generations. If we look back, we understand all the people who made the world and left us a better place. Our job is to make it so for future generations. You know, it's interesting that you, the, 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 I mean, there's so many, so many nuggets here that I think I, we have to sort of extract out and, and make sure we hold on to. This idea of a contract with God is very powerful for each and every one of us to realize that we all have a contract with God. You exactly. Know, I think, I think, people may feel, and I know you've, I've, I've heard you speak about this and I was very moved when, 
when you would say this, and I've heard your speeches since I was, you know, yeah, for my whole life. I mean, that I can remember. Um, and you, you speak about the power of a Jew and what it means across the world and how we care for each other and each individual matters. When, when, when people look around and they say to themselves, I'm not, I'm not that type. I'm not, that's not my, that's, I can't be an, I can't do anything. What would you respond to those that are thinking that they agree for, for someone else? Everybody can do something. No one can do everything. And each of us is given certain talents. And if we're privileged, then we get to use those in our lives. Look how many people are dissatisfied because they have to do something from nine to five that they don't really care about. And then from five to nine, they engage in communal stuff where they get the real sipaka nefesh, they get the real satisfaction. Mm -hmm. I was privileged to spend my whole life, my, whole, my days and my nights. And therefore I think that after Tuesday, I'm a volunteer because I put in my 40 hours by Tuesday and then the rest of the week, <laughs> I feel that I can, I'm on the equipment, but I can't dance, sing, write, I can't do oh, virtually anything, but I'm able to use those talents that God gave me in organizing and the speaking and whatever to, and it gives up me the satisfaction. But I realize I don't, I try not to see myself as others see me. I, I, you know, when they talk about Jewish leaders and Jewish, um, I, I think that I'm in a privileged position, but that puts on me that extra layers of, of, um, of responsibility. To, to know and to identify what are the things that I can bring to the Jewish equation. You, you mentioned power. Power is like a muscle. If you exercise it right, you build it up. If you abuse it, you destroy it. Mm -hmm. Jewish power is a sacred thing. America has imposed on Jews Jewish power. We were able to play a role in bringing Soviet Jewish Jews out, who everybody had written off to history. The same thing with Syrian Jews. And I negotiated, and you know, I went to see Assad and and with the president of the United States who first turned me down and then finally on Ethiopian Jews. And because of our persistence and staying being in the position, sitting in his office and not leaving until they gave me a yes to have the Boschwitz mission, which led to the rescue of, of Ethiopian Jews. The power is not in your mind. Power is in how you exercise your responsibility. Mm. And if you view it as something really sacred, previous generations didn't necessarily have it. You know, Jews in, in Germany in the turn of the century had an APAC. They had a lobby. They were very powerful, but they didn't know. And they ended up because of their internal divisions, et cetera, fighting each other rather than fighting against the enemy. We have to look that the one condition that God set for all the great miracles that happened to us was Jewish unity. Achtus was the one precondition to getting the Torah at Sinai to the rescue of Russian Jews and Ethiopian Jews. If we look at the story of Purim that we're going to celebrate, what was the answer to the threat? Esther says, Lech Kenos has called you to him. Go and gather all the Jews. She didn't say the North or South Shushan or those, all the Jews, because it's in the collectivity that we have our power. When we bring everybody together and realize what we have in common far outweighs our differences and that each of us brings something to the equation. Each of us can make a positive contribution to the future of the Jewish people. Wow. I think it's such, once we, we recognize that it is the responsibility that we take that allows us to create the power. I think it changes the equation for us. Um, I, I just want to thank you. I know we're running out of time because it's almost nine o'clock. I just want to thank you for, on behalf of all of us, I, and and I, I hope we get the opportunity to have you on again to really delve into some of these things as you're saying them. I'm sure, I'm sure each one is a show into itself, but- I just say one thing that to, to the listeners, because of Purim, I know it's your favorite holiday, and <laughs> mine too, I heard that from your introduction, that, you know, the halacha, the law is that if you read the Megillah as if it's something describing something that happened in ancient history, then you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah. If you don't understand the contemporary significance, if you don't live Purim, if you don't understand, look at anti-Semitism. Haman said, I'm ready to give everything up, all the power, wealth, everything, just because that one Jew wouldn't bow down to me. Incredible. That we learn the lessons for today. So we look back to look forward. For us, history is so important because it gives us the context to understand how we meet the challenges of today. Amazing. 
Amazing. Mr. Holland, thank you so much for joining. My pleasure. I hope we get to do this again. And I hope that next time, I hope we get to open it up to the, to the crowd. Cause I think a lot of people want to be asking you questions. So maybe we can work that out and thank you for shining your light in this world and inspiring us to do the same. My pleasure. Good job. It's good. Job. In Chodesh. And that was Malcolm Holine, a, a real leader um, of the Jewish people. I've been watching um, Mr. Holine, like I said, my entire adult life. And it's really spectacular what he does. And the truth of the matter is, I think just that last line, if I can pick it out before we get to our next wonderful interview, just the one line that he said that I, I think it's just, if we just pulled it out for a second, the responsibility is what exercises the muscle of power. You hear that? That means that me and you have all the power, if you will, that we need to make a difference. When you exercise the muscle of responsibility in your homes, in your communities, you build a strong, a strong amount of power. This is a very deep spiritual principle that's very much connected to the holiday coming up. Maybe we'll have the opportunity to talk about it in, at length. But uh, until then, um, our next guest is an incredible individual. Josh Brody is on next. He is a partner at Gibson Dunn and Crutcher. He's an activist in the Project Inspire world. Uh, Josh may be uh, accused of spending a little more time teaching and connecting with Jews than anything else that he's doing, but he is always, always uh, the, the consummate professional, but more importantly in his heart, he is the consummate leader and teacher. Uh, I had a chance to catch up with him earlier this week. Check out this interview with Josh Brody. It's an honor to have you on, and I thank you for your partnership with Project Inspire. How long have you been involved? Um, I want to say, oh gosh, almost been about seven years. Wow, seven years. And you are, you go on the missions. Like, give us a little bit about what you're doing with them. Yeah, my wife and I both are involved. We got involved in it seven years ago at the first Project Inspire convention. And since then, it's, right, we both take groups to Israel, um, which I went back when we were still doing that, you know, pre COVID. Um, and then when we come back, it's really about you know helping them continue to connect with Judaism and learn and grow. And so it's it's you know weekly learning groups, uh, hosting people at our home for Shabbat dinner, uh, you know just meeting and expanding our circles and meeting more and more Jews and trying to help them connect. So as someone who is on the giving side so much, one would think that you're a rabbi, but in fact you're not. No, you're no, not no. a rabbi. No, you're <laughs> you're you're an attorney. Give us a little bit about your what you do i mean basically i'm in the corporate restructuring business i represent both creditors and companies that are financial distress bankruptcy um you know things that and anything involving uh sort of financial restructuring so for those who aren't uh for, you know deciphering what you're saying basically you're a partner in a massive global law firm that is dealing with uh large corporations every single day in their restructuring and distress needs would that character yeah I guess you could put it that way yeah and I know you're being humble about it but I think it's important because I think that um it's important that someone who's in a, in a position like yours um and where you stand in terms of your own Jewish pride in terms of your Jewish involvement and what it means to really be an ambassador uh, you know the Jewish people are ambassadors for each other we don't have elected officials that represent us we all represent ourselves and each other what is what's it like for you being um, a proud Jew? What is it like um, in your career? How has Judaism played into your career, and how is it is this ambassador concept sort of a part of your of your life? Do you feel like you represent the Jewish people more than yourself? Do you do you get questions, and do you feel like when you're in a room that you are representing more than just yourself? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, it happens often enough, I've kind of stopped noticing it, but it happens often enough where, you know, people you deal with and they know because you're visibly Jewish and they, you know, start to, you know, they play Jewish geography or, you know, as they call it, getting bagels or whatever it is. And you, you, you notice that they're interacting with you in a little bit of a, of, of a different way. And you have to be a little more mindful of, you know, kind of how you're going to present yourself because especially, you know, as a, as a practical matter, people know that, I, or I know that people are going to have to make accommodations for me in terms of scheduling, especially, yeah. you know, on the holidays. And so I have, you know, just a certain amount of, I'm going to be asking more of people at times. So I feel like I need to really, you know, sort of be on my best behavior, but not as like a fake thing, but as like this is who I become. What does that feel like? Because I think it's important for all of us to, to sort of, you know, grapple with that, which is we are representing each other. There, there's a concept of one nation 
where we represent each other, where people look at one of us and say, that must be for all of you. Do you feel that burden when you walk into work every day? You know, I think initially, someone pointed this out to me when I first started working, because I was kind of clueless about it. Uh, and at the beginning, it did feel like a little bit of a burden. Over time, the reality is that it's not a burden so much as it is a, 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 a you know, responsibility slash privilege and that it really helps me be the best person I can be, right? We all want to be calm at all times, right? Every, we, all, we all have that person that we work with who cannot keep his, his or her cool. And it's like, you just don't want to work with them too much because they're always making a bigger deal out of it than it needs to be. And that one person who's always, you know, the, the rock, the person who's always relaxed and calm, we all want to be like that. Yeah. And knowing that I have this responsibility to hold myself out of, you know, a certain way, people are looking at me like that, is giving me the, you know, a certain resolve to be able to behave that way when I might otherwise not have done it, just knowing that people are watching. What's interesting, and I think what's important, is that this, whether we realize it or not, when you are Jewish, there people are looking at you and you're always in a way in the public eye. It may not be the entire United States of America public eye. It may just be the office public eye, but it's still the public eye. And yeah. I think being an ambassador means recognizing that and being the best you can be in every scenario, knowing, like you said, if I lose my cool, it's not a Josh Brody problem. It's a Jewish people problem. Right. And I don't want, I don't, I don't want people to think the Jewish people, right? And I think it's an important thing for all of us to take in. Amazing. Well, Josh, thanks so much for joining us on the show and thanks for what you do. Yeah, and you, you're, you're shining your light on this world and you're pending our people. So we appreciate it. Uh, just uh, do, doing what I can. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. All right. Good to see you. And we right. thank jo we you. thank Josh for that wonderful interview. Um, and really, that's what the show really is all about. It's about the recognition of who we are, the recognition of what's possible for us. And that concept that me and you can be more by just recognizing the role that we can play is really the moments that we realize on Shabbat. Shabbat is the time that the world slows down and it gives us a second to reach into something more, something that we can be more. And that's my job and your job, to see who we can possibly be and to be able to go week after week by being bigger every single week. So on behalf of me and mine to you and yours, I wish you a Shabbat Shalom. May this be a Shabbat where we realize how big we are. May this be a Shabbat where we realize how important our role is in the Jewish people. And may we be, have the good fortune of being the best that we really can be to setting our own contract with God. I hope next week to see you in Jerusalem, but if not, we hope to see you right back here at the Shabbat Show. To everybody, have a good weekend, a good Shabbos. And Shabbat Shalom. Jew, we together call it ah, do, ah, Jew. When every generation, they take one raising the haters. Then the shim hit the pavement, blazing the savers. And the world acts where they win. Patience are faithless. The Torah gave the whole world a facelift. If hatred is baseless, we take it, erase it, and exchange it for that master goal. We don't forget wherever we may go. There is only one place we know, and it's called to know. We go. We won. And you just fall it down, fall it down I'll pick you up And if you feel like you're outnumbered on a battle